Strange things are afoot at the Circle K. That kid is back on the escalator again. Ain't gonna hurt. Is my boomstick. Oh, game over, man. Game over. Welcome to the Bargain Bin. He's your host, Ben Mason. And he's your co-host, Sandrew Lukedic. And today we're talking 1996's Tales from the Crypt presents Bordello of Blood. I like spoilers who the fuck cares now man like this movie is so old and so much fun we've already covered demon knight let's get into the next best tales from the crypt movie but i have to ask what's your experience with this i'd seen it once before i clearly don't remember the situations surrounding it but i know i watched it with you can't remember if it was in person or over stream or how long ago it was mm -hmm. and that's what i remember <laughs> 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 it's well i mean that's fair i mean there's not a lot to remember about this movie other than the fact that it has dennis miller and a lot of nudity like i remember a few sparse details like the fact that the bordello went through the coffin to get there and stuff like that but i honestly forgot so much of it that it felt kind of like a fresher viewing experience I do have a question for you, though. Yeah, what's up? So this is our second Tales from the Crypt movie. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, what ties them together? Like, I, I know there's a few similar actors that maybe they go to a pool of people. Obviously, it has the Crypt Keeper. But, like, is it the same writers? Is it, like, what makes them Tales from the Crypt movies versus just two random horror movies that were stuck the Tales from the Crypt label. Tales from the Crypt, the TV show, is absolutely amazing for multiple reasons. Yes, I love all the stories. They're, they're uh, adaptations from the Tales from the Crypt comics, uh, Vault of Horror, like all the EC comics from way back when. Um, but it's the love of the content from the producers, of which there's like six. Uh, for the TV show. Uh, A.L. Katz, one of the producers, also co-wrote the script with the director of this movie. It's just... Uh, there are so many m like minimal hairs of connection uh, that, that really link everything together. It's just a type of story that nobody else does. I'm fine with there being minimal connections. I'm just curious what it is. And if it is just kind of like the feel of a story, you know, like you take postmodernistic writing often will have what's considered bad endings, right? Like not happy endings. Yes. If that's all it is, just, oh, there's some loose ties to the theme and the tone of the movies. I'm fine with that. I'm just curious because putting this side by side with like Demon Knight, I see very little in regards to resemblance, at least from my uneducated eye. Wow, really? Because I feel like these are definitely sibling films. Uh, uh, like, actors you already brought up, set pieces, uh, props, special effects techniques. They look very similar. There's a lot of similar plot points, too. It's the campiness that I think all the producers and directors here, because I think it was Ernest Dickerson last time for Demon Knight, and now we have Gilbert Adler who was a producer on Demon Knight uh, directing this one. There, there's a weird love of camp, horror, action, excessive nudity. Uh, and honestly, if, if you look at Demon Knight and Bordello of Blood, the actors are just having fun. Because I feel like with Tales from the Crypt, there is no pressure. You're there to tell a fun story, a ridiculous story that nobody else is willing to tell because you know they're not going to make money. It's excessive camp, like I said before, nudity. It's, it's grindhouse at its best without being exploitative. Um, and I, I think that's the main connection. Uh, it's a group of people getting together with similar interests, having fun. And you cannot deny that Bordello of Blood is a lot of fun. I still don't see the similarities. Really? Why? Yeah. 
Inter- okay, let's like uh, we'll we'll get into the game, we'll get into the the plot and everything. But you like the key, obviously, Bordello Bordello of Blood and Demon Knight share that. The campy humor, right on par. The vampires exploding is the exact same as the demons exploding. Okay, yeah, but that's not enough for me because you can see that in. You know, you get the same special effects people across different movies. There's going to be similarities to that. Fair. And I do find the humor very different between this and Demon Knight. Really? How? Yeah. How? Most of the humor in Demon Knight was really just the villain. And it was a lot more dark humor that was really in your face. Here, it feels like it's a lot of it leans on the sarcasm of Dennis Miller. And it just doesn't feel the same to me. Okay, I get a lot of the same type of dark humor from Feldman in this movie that we got from Billy Zane and Demon Knight. I mean, I like, obviously I, not I, I, to I the like same Feldman, extent. but that's not. Billy Zane is Billy Zane, right? Like, you, yeah, yeah, it is, nobody uh, compares. Yeah. <laughs> but no, I, I find that really strange because I, I do find that these films are so similar. That's very interesting. I, I'm very curious to hear your, your final take on this movie. Okay. Very curious. Well, before we get into any of that, it's time to play a game. Yeah, it's going to be a tough one for me. This is my humor when it <laughs> comes to this show. Uh, how many do we have? Uh, four. Okay. Erica Alaniac, who plays Catherine in this movie. Correct. We've encountered her in Under Siege. Correct. Chris Sarandon. Mm-hmm. Fright Night. Oh, he's so good in that. He's so he's good in everything. Yeah, he's so this. good. No, no, he's great in this. No. <laughs> okay. Um obviously Feldman. Yep. And this is going to kill me because I'm sure I'm going to forget something. But we've got Lost Boys, mm-hmm. License to Drive, mm-hmm. Gremlins, mm-hmm. The Burbs. Yeah. Is there another one? Same one you forgot when we did Gremlins. Oh, ah, uh, uh, Ninja Turtles. That's right. Yes. Nice. Fourth one, I have no idea. It's a small one. Is that a joke? In this movie, it is. Is it Phil, Phil Fondacaro? No, no. Um, it's a small role in this movie, and I wouldn't be surprised if you didn't get it. Hmm. Yeah, I don't know. Who is it? William Sadler. Oh, my God. That should have been my number one. Yeah, it should have been. We were just talking about Demon Knight. I know. He's so good in Demon Knight. He's great in this, too. But, I mean, I didn't even realize that it was him until I looked it up because oh, really? he's, co- he's covered in this, right? Like he's a mummy. I wouldn't be surprised if people didn't know that that's him in those scenes. Yeah. But like when you look at him in when we covered um, uh, Disturbing Behavior. Oh, he was so good in that. He, he, it's the exact same voice. He's well, yeah, the if exact you're familiar same with his voice, yes. Raps from the Bay. <laughs> <laughs> he's so good William Sadler is so good in everything he does he needs to be in more movies mm-hmm. I love him so much let's do a buddy cop movie with him and uh, Demichi oh my god could you imagine but like they're cops of some sort of paranormal stuff and now, now we're talking R.I.P.D. with Ryan Reynolds and uh, Jeff Bridges no yeah, one wants good. that yeah that would be great <laughs> That one key difference. Let's make a good one. I guess we should say there was also John Kassir as the voice of the Crypt Keeper in both movies. Yeah, I didn't count that, though, because even in the credits, it's not listed the same way. So, oh, okay. It's fine, but I actually had to break my rule for this one. Um, because if you look on at least IMDb, there's so many of the cast that are listed in the uncredited <laughs> section. Yes. Yeah. Like, for some reason, Angie Everhart, Corey Feldman, William Sadler, they're all uncredited in this movie. <laughs> how, how amazing is Angie Everhart in this movie? 
But it's like I, I I had to look at the uncredited when some of the main cast was there. Yeah, it's it's weird, man. It it like the Tales from the Crypt oeuvre just feels like a big group of friends that just chip in when they can. <laughs> All right, well, oh yeah, you did get disturbing behavior, so we're we're done the game. I didn't do too bad. Other than forgetting William Sadler, you nailed it. Okay, I'm so good at this. I'm getting better. Yeah, except look at who you forgot. I'm, I'm, I'm nailing this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, whatever you need to do to make yourself feel better there. Progress, man. <laughs> All right, let's get into this movie. Okay, so immediately we cut to the, uh, the mountains of Tierra del Fuego, which is in South America. I didn't realize that was an actual place. <laughs> I didn't even bother looking it up. <laughs> yeah, it's like it it it's weird because it's on the border of a couple different countries like Chile and and whatnot. But uh, basically, an Indiana Jones open, right? Yeah, it almost looks like, and I I don't want to sound insensitive, but it almost feels like by using a little person that they're gonna do a parody of it. Yeah. Well, Phil Fondacaro as Vincent, like the leader of these adventurers. He's really, really good in this movie. And I feel like this is one of the few roles he's ever had where he's allowed to show that he's an amazing actor. Yeah, rather than just being put there because of a stature. Exactly. Uh, and we get him a lot in this movie, and I am very happy with that because he steals multiple scenes. But yeah, we have a bunch of adventurers uh, discovering a tomb housing the corpse of Lilith quoted to be the most horrible woman the world has ever known. So Vincent, the leader of the group, has been searching for her body for years so he can return the heart to the body. Interesting lore. I'm curious to know how you feel about it. Why? Yeah. Like, they don't really go into it, and I don't think you need to. This is just me nitpicking. But it's like, why? Does he want power? Is he just really lonely? <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we do get, we get the reasoning later on. He, he was hired by uh, J.C. Current, the Reverend, Chris Sarandon, to, to resurrect Lilith. His use for Lilith was to start up a brothel. This is so convoluted. To start up <laughs> the brothel to lure in sinners and cleanse the earth. That seems like such a bad idea. Well, you're murdering people straight up. You're sending them to a violent, horrible death where they go to hell. Yeah, but even just the idea that you're using a weapon you can't control. Well, and that's the thing, too. The person who holds the key controls Lilith. Hold the fucking key. Don't give it to Vincent. <laughs> well, he needed to give it to Vincent to free her, and then. I guess eventually just didn't get it back. Yeah. Well, why? Why? As soon as you get back with your like vampire goddess, be like, please give me that key back right now because this is my plan. Why would, you, why would you even trust him at that point? Like, He's going to come back and murder me immediately. I'm not giving him this key. Very plausible. I don't know. It's Tales from the Crypt, man. It's campy. We really can't nitpick too hard. Oh, but we can. <laughs> we can, and I'm sure both of us will. I'm just saying we should. Listen, I'm going to say this right now for full disclosure to anybody who's listening. Oh, God. I am going to be overly nitpicky because otherwise there would not be a lot to talk about in this very shallow movie. What are you talking okay. about? This movie. I can't do, so I can't do a review that is just like, and then they showed boob for five minutes, okay? Like, I need to talk about something. <laughs> There's a reason why I picked this movie. Because you wanted to see boobs for five minutes? Yes. Okay, great. How do you talk about that? Uh, awkwardly, I guess? Yeah. Well, like, yeah. I've already completed it. No, we'll, we'll get to it again a few times. Okay, but I mean, back, I, I don't know how much <laughs> analyzing you did in that regard, but beyond saying that it's shown, I... A lot. Okay, if we get into things like measurements and shapes, there's a problem here. Uh, no problem. Everything here is great. <laughs> I you mean, let's sound, be honest. <laughs> you almost sounded like Stallone there. Yeah, no problem. Yeah, no problem. <laughs> yeah. So the heart, the heart split into four pieces in the box. 
thoughts on that because when they he when Vincent takes out the the separating little like divider things and you see the heart start to uh, reattach itself, bad effects. But I like the idea and I think it works for this film. There's no reason to keep them separate. You're right. I never thought about that. Even if they fuse together as one heart, it's useless until it meets the body. So. I get if it was in four pieces and they had to collect them, but there's no real reason to keep them separate at this point because you other, still need the body. Other than carrying around a beating heart, which I think could be wearing on someone. Yeah, I guess that's true. Get a soundproof box. I don't know. A soundproof box. Excuse me, sir. I would like to procure a container for a beating heart that would be soundproof so I don't have to listen to it. Well, as opposed to, I'd like a container with four chambers to keep a heart separated, and they need to have sliding doors for those chambers. Yeah, that's fine. You'd be like, I would yeah, like uh -huh, a puzzle uh -huh. box. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. No one's going to be like, I need a soundproof <laughs> box. And then someone's going to be like, why? What are you putting in there? It's going to be emitting so much sound that you don't want to hear it. I'm transporting metronomes. Oh, fuck. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god. <laughs> Fine. All right, I'll give you that. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, you picked this movie, man. I know, and I'm glad I did. <laughs> well, this is what you've left me to talk about. So we've, we, we've discovered the skeleton of Lilith, and Vincent places the heart into it, eventually bringing it back to life. Eventually. Um, so, yes, the mother of all vampires has risen. And we get what I like to think is the second best head crushing scene in a film. What's first? You just caught me off guard. <laughs> you just said it. I know I had it in my notes and I accidentally deleted it. Never mind, we'll get back to it. Okay. Uh, but yes, we get the key again from, from Demon Knight. I, uh, I really enjoy the fact that they repurposed the main prop from the last movie. Um, but they, they change all of the lore behind it. And I, I really like that. It's, Why didn't it, they bring back Dick Miller? Was he dead at this point? I don't think so. 96? Yeah. When did Dick Miller die? I clearly do not have that information, man. I'm going to look it up right now. Dick okay. Miller. Nope, nope. He was still alive. He died in 2019. Yeah, so if you're gonna if you're gonna bring in something from the first movie, oh, it's got to be Dick Miller. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, they they fucked up there. I'm assuming he's either too old, retired, or just couldn't do it. <laughs> just didn't want to. <laughs> Look, I've seen enough boob in my day. I don't need this. <laughs> yeah, Uncle Willie though, he was so good. A fitting um, name for this movie, I guess. Yeah, right. <laughs> So whoever possesses the key controls Lilith. We've been over this. It's a major plot hole. But then we cut from this to a mummy telling the story to the Crypt Keeper. And yes, it's great to see William Sadler again. I love hearing John Kassir as the Crypt Keeper. Um, rock, paper, scissors, though. It just seems like such a weird thing to get into. Nah, it's a man's game. And, like, it, it is a callback to an old episode of Tales from the Crypt, which I love. But, like, the Crypt Keeper loses his hand and then just gets into the intro to the movie. And I love his intros. Uh, it, one of my favorite parts of the TV show. I love that they kept that for the movies. Um, it's just such a great character. I would love to see a revival of Tales from the Crypt. I'm also very scared that if they do it, they're just going to ruin everything so after the key this is the second and maybe final thing that i see connected to demon knight <laughs> okay <laughs> all right well then we get back to the movie so we meet Catherine, played by erica olaniak and she's exercising while listening to televangelist reverend jc current played by chris sarandon um i'm curious about the name jc current I because think that they just wanted to play up the initials of Jesus Christ. Well, the current Jesus Christ. J.C. Current. Yeah, that, I think that's it. I don't think there's anything much deeper than that. But I believe they call him by his first name. I think it's like Jason or something and just ruin that. So I don't know why they would do that. 
Yeah, I was under the impression that JC was just his initials for the most exactly. part. Exactly. So, okay. And then we cut to her rebellious brother, Caleb, played by Corey Feldman, who's piercing his tongue. That seems like, a, like I, I get some home piercings, but the tongue seems like a bad idea. Yeah, I think tongue piercing hasn't really been around in a very long time. It, it might have died around the time of this film. But Feldman's in fine form here. You can't deny that. I would say probably at his best. Yeah, this is good Corey Feldman for sure. Yeah, he's doing a great job, which I don't think we've ever seen from Feldman. What are you talking about? What do you mean? He's name, in Lost Boys. Yeah, I know. He wasn't great there. His acting was pretty poor in The Lost Boys. <laughs> Here he could have had a larger role. Like his acting was on point. He was doing a great job. I was. I definitely agree impressed. with you on that point. He definitely should have had a larger role in this. Yeah, I liked how uh, how Catherine complains that half of the neighborhood can hear his music because he's blasting it. So he just cranks it up. and He's like, "There, and that's for the other half." I'm like, "Fuck, give me more of this character. I love it. I, I love that we have the righteous sibling and the rebellious sibling. Like, it's it's." Pretty good dichotomy. So we cut to a bar where Caleb is partying with his friends, and then we get the dart to the nut scene. No, he didn't even try to avoid it. No. And I don't know why the scene's here, other than to show us that they're a bunch of idiots, but it does cut to our methed out biker dude. I, I think it's more to show what sort of clientele that this methed out biker dude, as you call him, is looking for. Because yes. you see these idiots in the bar doing this stuff, and it's a pretty safe bet that those are the types of people you want to bring in. Um, see, I, I agree with you, but I don't know if that's the case. Because he gives the exact same speech to Rafe later on in the movie, and Rafe is nothing like these guys. It actually feels like this methed out biker dude, when he's doing his speeches, is like not a real person. Yeah. Yeah, he's just he's like, uh, familiar, right? Yeah, but like it looks like when he's talking to Wraith specifically, he's just repeating the same lines from this scene, and they don't even really feel like they fit the context of their conversation at that point. I agree. Like, like pre-recorded messaging that's just playing regardless. Yeah. Which I would have been fine with if you found out later that he wasn't a real person and really just a puppet that was playing a recorded message. You know, I actually would be pretty down with that. It would work in this movie. It is a ridiculous film, and yeah, that would be perfect. But, Sandro, at this yeah. brothel, the girls do things there aren't even names for. I disagree. I know, but still, it's a pretty good sell. So we have to go Unless to he's referring to the part where they eat your heart. Is there a term for eating someone's heart? I don't think so. I guess it could loosely fall under cannibalism? Is there a term <laughs> for eating somebody's heart? Meaning of eat your heart out in English. No. No, because if, if that's the case, that could be what he's referring to. So they are doing things that they don't have names for. He's not lying. Word for destroying someone's heart physically. Cardiectomy. To mean removal of the heart or removal of the cardiac portion of the stomach. What? what? Okay. We'll, we'll go with no. No. <laughs> we'll I'm trying no. to give the movie credit for being clever there. Dang, okay. I, I, I'll stop. Anyway, you go to 325 Beaumont and ask for the Cunningham wake. So Caleb bites and I'm he and sorry. his friend Reggie go to the address, which turns out to be a funeral home. Why are you sorry? Because... You gotta be a complete moron. <laughs> and why is their cover like a mortuary or, or wait, like there's gotta be a number of guys that are like, no. <laughs> oh, I disagree. <laughs> if you like, tell me more. I think the funeral home as a cover for a bordello is brilliant. <clears throat> no? No. Why? What do you think is a better cover? I don't know. Anything? Give me an example. Fast food restaurant? A laundromat. It's not a bad idea. A blood donor clinic. 
it's pretty much the same as a funeral home. I don't know. Okay. Well, uh, I, I accept your uh, disdain, but I, I think a funeral home is a great, well, especially for Tales from the Crypt, that makes perfect sense. It's a great cover for a bordello. Yeah, but you got to imagine that the characters in this movie don't know that they're in a Tales from the Crypt movie, where they're like, oh well, yeah, that, that flies. They reference Tales from the Crypt in the movie. It has a different meaning to them. Because <laughs> if Fair they enough. knew that they were in a Tales from the Crypt movie, they'd be like, oh, I'm definitely not going there. Yeah, well, yeah. I, I, also, if you realize you're in a Tales from the Crypt movie or a TV show, you're like, I'm, uh, there, there's a couple things I'm going to have to do. I'm probably going to have as much sex as possible, or do as many drugs as possible, because I'm not going to make it out of here. Or you have the opposite mentality of I'm not going to do these things because those are the people that die. You're in the episode. It's going to happen. No. What's your take on the creepy mortician uh, McCutcheon? Love it. Right? Perfectly like, what, Once you're in the door and he's got a gun to you, now you just got to go with it. He's such a good actor. And I, I don't. I, I feel like I recognize him, but at the same time, I don't. I know he's been in movies I've watched before. Like, he was in uh, The Clockwork Orange. He was in The Wicker Man. Like, very small roles. But his acting in this movie, uh, Aubrey Morris, it is so good. I feel like I've missed out on some great roles he's played. It's possible. So, yeah, you said he forces the guys to get into a coffin at gunpoint. And the coffin goes through the crematorium oven whatnot before coming at the other end in a brothel and my next note just says terror leads to tits and that is our theme for this movie ridiculous over the top campiness and a fair amount of nudity yeah this is quite the bro quite the brothel and i don't know how all of this is underground but i'm totally in so reggie's taken to a room by Tulula, and lilith takes over Again, I have to say that Angie Everhart is absolutely amazing in this movie as Lilith. Well, what I, does she really do? She just has to be Angie Everhart as Lilith. It's yeah. Fine. It's like, look the way you do. Perfect. It's, it's also her voice and the way she speaks. Very much a Kathleen Turner kind of scenario where she has such a unique voice and a candid way of speaking that it commands your attention. Is she good in the movie? Debatable. But she is so unique compared to everyone else we see on screen that she, you, you can't look away from her. She demands your attention. Well, I'd argue she can't be bad in the movie because outside of some dialogue that she does have, which she holds up just fine, especially in the scene later where she's actually confronting Dennis Miller in his office. Yeah. Beyond that, really her role is to just look the way she does. And does she ever? <clears throat> right? So you can't really fail at that. Fair. Fair. I don't think anyone's going to say she's one of the most amazing actors ever. But no, she, but they she gave her a cast. role. Exactly. They gave her a role that suits that. She has been cast very well in everything she's been in. So we cut to the police station where Catherine's reporting her brother missing. And this is this is where we get our intro to Rafe Gutman, played by Dennis Miller. Um, what's your immediate take on this guy? Well, I, he's almost like an ambulance chaser, but <laughs> hanging out at the police station to find <laughs> crimes to follow up on. Yes, agreed. He's probably the most sarcastic person or character we've covered in any episode of this show. And you know I'm a fan of that. Yeah. I uh, See, I thought you would love him. I thought every oh. time he spoke, you would be laughing, or at least giggling to yourself a little bit. If not, I was at least anticipating what he was going to say every time he opened his mouth. Yeah. He's also the epitome of Shady. Oh. <laughs> how, how old is this character supposed to be? I have no idea. Because he's very suggestive towards Erica and I feel like the age uh, difference think? there <laughs> I feel like the age difference there would make him a little bit creepy I could be wrong everything about this guy is weird like right down to 
the fact that he's still going through a divorce and he talks to his soon to be ex lovingly in a hateful way, which sounds ridiculous. But it's even like he's so warm and upfront. And then we'll end a phone call with, okay, goodbye, fuck you, and hang up. He nails it. He just he, nails it. The weird thing is, if you look up anything else he's ever done, I don't think he's acting. I really don't. I think he's just saying lying because this is Dennis Miller in real life. He had his weird political talk show. He was on, uh, was it like Monday Night Football or something? He sounds the exact same no matter what he does. Yeah, I don't know. Honestly, I recognize Dennis Miller. I don't think I've seen anything else he's been in, but I really do get the impression that they were just like, here's the script. Do it however you want. And he's like, okay, so I'm just not going to try. I'm just going to smile, smirk, and say these lines in my usual smarmy way. And you know what? It really works for the character. Yeah, it's like he's the only one who's in on his own jokes. <laughs> I, I really used to like this guy, but his political opinions really overtook his comedy. Having said that, though, I don't think you could cast anybody else as this character except for maybe Billy Zane. I mean, you can cast Billy Zane in almost anything. I know, right? But I would love to see Billy Zane as Rafe Gutman. That would have been a nice link to the previous film, too. But yeah, he convinces Catherine to hire him to look for Caleb. Uh, you were saying he was hitting on her, which, yeah, he does. And I find it really weird then that he says that she isn't his type. <laughs> right after she catches him, like, ogling her legs. Yeah. She covers herself up. <laughs> he's like, yeah, you know, he's just not really my type. And then takes the case. So Gutman goes to the bar and interrogates Caleb's friends. I, I don't really care for this scene, but it's necessary for him to get the information to go to the brothel. <laughs> I find it funny that the friends are so unwilling to help him. Because they also seem to have not noticed that their friends have been missing for days. If an, yeah, investigator came, if an investigator came to me and was like, yeah, your friend that you haven't seen for a few days is missing and I'm looking for him, I'd be like, oh, yeah, maybe I should help you out. No. No, why? Why, why would you I don't do want that? you to find him. Yeah. <laughs> Leave him where he is. He's fine, I'm sure. I was sick of that guy anyway. <laughs> <laughs> so Rafe arrives at the funeral home mid-service. And then ends up sitting next to the, uh, the meth head biker. His name's Jenkins, I guess. Uh, complaining about how bright it is. Why is he there? I don't know. Yeah. I've always had a problem with that. There is no reason for him to be there. We do get something I really enjoy, though. And that's the pallbearers uh, seeming to have a problem lifting the casket. Why would it be so heavy, Sandro? Because there's multiple bodies inside. Exactly. Although, now that you mention it, <clears throat> outside of like being a little bit suspicious for bringing people in, it's a good cover for disposing of the bodies. It really is. But at the same time, why wouldn't you just cremate them? <sighs> That's a good question. Um, I do not have a clever or witty response to that. It would just make more sense, right? It would. <laughs> but it doesn't, it doesn't provide such a, a fun seen in a film like it, it's very campy to load up a casket with multiple bodies and have people like struggle to lift it and like slip and slide everywhere trying to get it to the grave that's very much tales from the crypt so and I then you that. couldn't have a scene where you investigate the bodies because it would just be ash very true yeah i didn't think about that uh we cut to jc current's church where he's giving a sermon and suffers slightly <laughs> due to the teleprompter. Chris Sarandon nailing it here. No, he's not. He is. He's what? what? Explain yourself. <clears throat> this isn't the character for him. Oh, I disagree greatly. Why not? What do you think? What do you think he can't bring to this role? Or what do you think is limiting him from this role? Well, first of all, I don't know who could make this role good. I think he was miscast in this right from the start. He needs to have a much more charismatic role. Mm, I see where you're going. 
but I, I don't think he did a bad job. Maybe my expectations are just too high of him. Because of Fright Night? Oh, he was so good in it. Yeah. Is it Jerry Dandridge? Is his name in that? Oh. Yeah, he, he was absolutely amazing in that movie. You're right. Um, I hate the fact that it turns into a musical church, him with his guitar. I'm like, oh, God. But I love it because it makes me dislike the character even more. So I'm assuming... I hate this character. I think we're supposed to. Oh, absolutely, we're supposed to hate this character. But I think they make us hate him so much that when he has that turnaround and tries to right his wrongs, we don't care. Yeah, he's a little too far gone for a little bit of a character turn to actually have me care about him in any way. Yeah, I feel the exact same way. Uh, but we get the return of Vincent, the adventurer. And we fully on learn now that Catherine actually does work for the Reverend. I thought she might have just been a fan or like a listener, but no, she is employed by J.C. Current. Rafe shows up and we get more of his sarcasm, uh, filling in Catherine on what he's learned that Caleb, <laughs> I love when Caleb went to a whorehouse, a house filled with whores. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> like, that's really funny. But then my next note just says, good Christ, this writing is great. And then she's just like, oh, well, that solves it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Case like, closed. I don't expect like, him to come back. He's still not back. <laughs> he's not living there. Maybe but in her mind, she thinks he's taken up like a semi-permanent residence. He's like, ah, I'll come around eventually. <sighs> just having too much fun. Yeah, there, there are a fair amount of plot holes in this. You are correct. Uh, back at the bar, Rafe encounters the meth head again. And he gives the exact same speech he gave Caleb and his friends. We've covered that. He's not even looking. He's not even looking at Rafe when he delivers most of the lines this time. He's just saying it. And it's like, I didn't go back and check it that thoroughly, but it feels like it's word for word the exact same script he gave the guys. I, I also believe it's the exact same script. But there is part of it that has stayed with me since I saw this movie in 96. And that is the pronunciation of yeah, damn. Stuck with me. I've said it a few times. Does not go over well out of context. But we cut to the funeral home where we see how truly disturbed this mortician is. Uh, this is a creepy, creepy scene. McCutcheon is, uh, I mean, he's probably the most vile character in the movie. And he's not even a vampire. Oh, but I, I could see this guy playing, like, the role of, like, a modern-day Dr. Frankenstein in this scenario. I could see a whole movie about this character. Yeah, I'd be okay with that, too. It kind of reminds me of Dr. Giggles. No, I'm but, not familiar with that. Oh, a Larry Drake movie from the 90s. Oh, God, it's so good. We should, we should cover that soon. But, yeah, cutting open a corpse and delighting in the smells that it emits. I mean, they always say, if you love what you do, you never work a day. And this guy hasn't worked in oh, a for, long time. For fuck's sake. <laughs> <laughs> so gross. He is having a blast, dude. Like, he is having the time of his life. He's talking to the... Molesting? <laughs> I mean... Having I a time, you're right. I didn't say what you do is appropriate, but if you love what you do, you don't work a day. <laughs> Fair enough. <laughs> Jesus. JC Current. T uh, tell me that I'm not correct in that. <sighs> yeah, he loves yeah, it. Yeah, he does. You're right. Rafe arrives and is quickly turned away, so he just breaks in, listens in on Lilith interviewing a prospect. And discovers Reggie's nose piercing. Oh, wait, no, it's Caleb's nose piercing. Why would they take that out of him? Well, all four of them had the same nose piercing. Yes. I can't remember. Does Caleb have it later in the movie when we see him? Because when Rafe shows it to Catherine, she assumes that it's Caleb's. But it, Caleb's still alive. Well, mm, quote, alive. Reggie is not. So I thought it would have been Reggie's nose piercing. It very well could be. Like I said, all four of the friends have the same one. So it still points them in the right direction. 
True. All right. It it serves its point. So yeah, Rafe shows her and tells her that he'll be staking out the mortuary that night. So we cut to that night and the meth head returns. But this time, McCutcheon welcomes Rafe. We get the coffin scene again and a very naked dance party. Uh, again, I know it sounds weird, but I love how Tales from the Crypt embraces nudity and campiness. There was nothing else like this at the time, and I don't think there's been anything like it since. Uh, it really embraces 80s horror tropes that, uh, that don't fly anymore. How old were you when you saw this movie the first time? 14. No, well, that's why you loved it. I still love it. <laughs> I'm just talking about 14-year-old you. Okay, you can talk about 41-year-old me too, man. So, wait a minute, how many boobs? What? How all often? Of, all of them. <laughs> all of them all the time. I'm fine with that. I'm in. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Lilith immediately takes note of Rafe. Uh, we learn more about the, the method Jenkins, who was basically, what I said before was a familiar for Lilith. I'm kind of reaching for that, but do you agree that's what he is? Yeah, well, it sounds like he's just wanting the promise of becoming a vampire and having eternal life. Yeah, because he, he's suffering from being out in the sun and luring people in. Like, he's obviously having a bad time, and she just kills him. But for what reason? Because he was demanding things that they didn't want. And yeah. He was becoming so, a little bit of a liability. So she rips his head off. But that's the end of the familiar character. We don't get another one. They'll find another one. I guess, but you think that's something that they would tackle in the film? Or maybe not. Maybe I'm looking too no, much into I don't, it. I don't think it's that important. Yeah. You're, I think you're it's right. just meant the to story, display, it's not. I think it's just meant to display that Lilith doesn't really value any relationships. Even if you're on her side, she'll kill you if you even remotely give her the impression that you're not going to go her way. Yeah. Um, the next scene is Rafe and the prospect who we saw Lilith interviewing previously in a torture chamber. And this, this is the only problem I have with this movie, really. And that's the pronunciation of this woman's name. What is it? Do you say Tamara or Tamara? I say Tamara. I say Tamara too. The last few times I've encountered this name, it's Tamara. Nah, I don't think it matters that much. I know, right? But it makes me feel weird. Uh, although Rafe has a great line right here where he says, be careful, or no, be gentle. I used to be a virgin. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> that is the epitome of Rafe Gutman right there. His sarcasm, his, I, it's not even wit. He's just a fucking asshole. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but he does it so well with a smile on his face that you accept it. I, you just want to punch him. Every, like, that smile is the worst because he's so high on himself. But he, he tricks her into a torture rack and leaves, but drops his wallet unknowingly. Hmm. Then, yes, discovers Jenkins' body, the method's body in the casket. And Lilith questions Tamara and Tamara. Taste ta Tamara. <laughs> Just say it how you want. No, it's Tamara, according to the okay. movie. Okay, all right. And taste Rafe's blood. And she says he has one in a million blood type. That's not real. <laughs> she somehow immediately tracks him down to his office in that warehouse. Yeah, because I, I, I guess I she has the really for that one in a million blood type. <sighs> I, I hate that, but yes, you are correct. Um, she seems to have the same powers as Billy Zane's collector in Demon Knight, like making people hallucinate, trying to sway them to agree with her and do her bidding. So I think that is, yes, another strong connection to, to Demon Knight. Oh man, her and Billy Zane as a villain couple would be phenomenal give me that movie right now i didn't even think about that and they're up against uh demichi and, and uh, william sadler yeah with dick miller as a side character i would pay a ridiculous amount of money to see that movie <laughs> yeah, well 
We have to figure out how to bring Dick Miller back from the dead, though, and resurrect <laughs> Billy Zane's acting career. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get in touch with Billy Zane. You work on the Dick Miller situation. Oh, yeah. Give me the easy one. It's fine. You just have to find the four pieces of his heart, reattach them, and put it into his skeleton. You'll be fine. Then he'll kill me if I've learned anything from this well, movie. Well, then get Phil Fondacaro <laughs> to do it for you. <laughs> Just make sure to get the key back from him as soon as the ritual is done. Next scene. <laughs> Rafe goes to the police and we find out he no longer has a license to be an investigator. But it doesn't really matter, does it? No, he can just be a dude investigating. Exactly. Catherine convinces the police that Rafe has a lead on her brother's disappearance and they go to the funeral home where Rafe tries to show them the entrance of the brothel and they just shut him down because honestly, yeah, it is pretty far fetched. I get that. Well, because he pulls the lever and it just goes into the fire. And I love it because the, the caretaker is like, that coffin costs like a thousand dollars. It's good. <laughs> Tales from the Crypt, everybody. Watch the show, watch the movies, except for the third one. You do not want to watch that. You're going to have a fun time with everything else, though. So Lilith and Vincent talk, and we learn that the Reverend is in cahoots with the brothel. It, like, we kind of already assumed that, but here it's confirmed, using the bordello to kill sinners. We cut to a church rehearsal with a full-on giant Satan puppet thing. That they're going to shoot a laser at. Yeah, it's just an intro to the laser used to kill the devil, which, like, it burns a, a cross into its chest. It, it, it's fine. We won't be seeing that again. It just seems like a bad idea to put a laser into a public space like that. Obviously, it's, it works for the movie, but... It's yeah. pointing away from the parishioners. Everyone's fine. Yeah, no, no chance of accidents happening at all. Never. So we cut to the pallbearers struggling to carry another casket to the grave. Rafe is on scene and informs us that this particular person died from a flesh-eating disease and weighed next to nothing when they died. Curious. We already know, man. Like, we get it. <laughs> then we get another bar. And even more nudity. And here the Reverend meets with Lilith and Vincent. Full reveal that the Reverend got Vincent to track down Lilith. Catherine shows up trying to make a documentary about the vileness of the sex industry, engages Lilith, and JC panics like a madman and tries to hide. I love that you called in another bar when it's clearly a strip club. Another bar. I, 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 no, I know is, that there's going to be a, a bar with it's alcohol, the, but... It's the same set, even. <laughs> you know what it is. I know, yeah, it's a strip club. Rafe opens this casket at the graveyard and finds multiple bodies, including the meth head Jenkins. And then we get Vincent and Lilith turning on JC. Shocker. The first time JC treats Vincent like a jerk in his office, you're like, he's not going to last. He's, they're going to turn on him. Like, yeah. Well, and when turning on him, I have to ask you, why does Vincent destroy the key? Setting what? Lilith free. Why does he have the key? Because JC gave it to him and didn't ask for it back because he's an idiot. Well, I thought in this situation, Vincent took it out of the safe, but still get the idea, right? Yeah, okay. Maybe I, maybe I missed that. At the same time, though, Vincent has it. And as we've already established, whoever has the key controls Lilith. So destroying the key means you're, you're pretty much dead. Yeah, now she can so, do whatever she wants. So what are we doing here? Vincent, what is going on, my friend? Uh, I pretty much expected her to immediately kill Vincent after that, too. Yeah, yeah, same. Uh, Rafe shows Catherine the photos from the funeral, uh, but Jenkins doesn't show up in the pictures. Uh, looking at her footage that she shot at the bar, they can't see Lilith, but Catherine does notice JC in the background. Okay. I'm okay with that. You're not? That's fine. Whatever. Okay. She and Rafe converse. Rafe presents the idea that they're dealing with vampires. And she immediately shuts him down, but then retracts the denial for no real reason. You have footage where Lilith doesn't appear. Even if you don't believe in vampires, something is amiss. Yeah. 
And then getting the call from Caleb crying for help. My note says there's no way this is a setup. But we get the quote from Rafe saying, saying, I feel like we're in a bad Tales from the Crypt episode. I am 100% okay with that. They arrive on scene and Caleb reveals himself as a vampire. Again, Feldman on point here, stealing the show. Why? I don't know. He doesn't need to be there. Why, why is he a vampire? Why versus all of the other people that they ripped out their hearts and ate them, did they decide we're going to turn this one into a vampire? He's the only male vampire in the film. Yeah. So why? Because he's Corey Feldman. He's a Feld dog. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I get it. You need to give him a little bit more screen time. Otherwise, he would have been in the burbs more than this. But oh, could just... you imagine if Haim showed up as a vampire also? Oh, my God. That'd be my this would be my favorite movie of all time. Oh, OK, Ben, calm down. <laughs> my question stays the same. Why did they turn him into a vampire? There's no reason. Unless they were like, oh, we need him to lure her out. But at that point, they didn't know she was looking for him. So they didn't need it. They didn't have a reason to have him as a backup plan. No. It's just, it's, it's Corey Feldman. They, they needed some <laughs> star power. <laughs> I mean, he's a star to me. Uh, they tried to escape by a swinging chain. Very, very Star Wars. Uh, Catherine nails it. Rafe overswings and flies through a window, landing onto a police car. The vampires abduct Catherine. He is Rafe... way too unscathed for what he just did. <laughs> oh, I know. I know. It works, though. It's just campiness, man. We're just telling a fun story. Reality does not exist. You can't even put, like, a scratch on him? <laughs> no, the, the, not even a little bit of blood. He's fine. You, you went through a window, down a couple stories, and landed on a police car. Nothing. Even the car doesn't take damage. <laughs> Rafe's taken to the hospital where Tamara tries to kill him. Tamara. But he, ta ta Tamara. <laughs> but he turns the table on her. And we get a cameo from Whoopi Goldberg, because why not? Why? Why, <laughs> why is she in this? I have no idea, but I love it. Whoopi Goldberg is amazing. Catherine's in a torture rack at the brothel, getting molested by Lilith as Caleb watches, which is rather disturbing. And I don't know why it's in here, but okay. <laughs> it's just a scene. Rafe arrives at the brothel and encounters the Reverend, who's there to destroy everything. I mean, cool character turn for JC, but as we said before, we don't really care anymore. Also fully displays the fact that he did not have a backup plan. There is yeah. no fail safe for if <laughs> like, there is no fail safe for if this doesn't work out in his favor. Jesus saves. <laughs> so we get water guns filled with holy water. And this is a trope we get in so many vampire films that I am done with. I hate it. I hate it so much. It's not done nearly as well here as even, like, say, The Lost Boys. Agreed. It's, I mean, like, it's a fun scene, but it's so stupid. And that, that has to be what they were going for. Like, they clearly were just trying to do this scene, which they know has been done, but in just, like, a completely carefree, like, yeah. the two of them might as well have but, been skipping through a meadow. But I feel like... I think I think from Dusk Till Dawn came out the same year and they have the exact same scene but it's done so much better and the effects are so much better. Um I wouldn't know. You haven't seen From Dusk Till Dawn? That is what I suggested, yeah. You might have just changed my pick for next week. You do realize that you are still to this day surprised by all the movies that I haven't seen. Even though we've done this for almost 150 episodes, you should know by now. Yeah, but you haven't seen From Dust Till Dawn? I haven't seen a lot of movies. Okay. Well, I will give you the <laughs> choice at the end. I don't know um, if I'm going to do another vampire movie right after. Okay. The week after next. Okay, fine. So, vampires exploding, exact same special effects as the demons exploding in Demon Knight. I actually really enjoyed that because I thought they looked fantastic. Caleb attacks Rafe with an axe, but is taken out way too fast. And I think that's a shame because we need more Corey Feldman in this movie. 
Lilith kills JC, then takes an axe to the shoulder from Wraith, and I think that looked amazing. It might be in the best instance of practical effects in this movie. Agreed. It, it's there's really not a lot of CG in the movie, though. Like the practical effects in this film are phenomenal. Mm, I would argue that they're not, but that's okay. Well, I think they work with the tone of the film. And the reason I say what, the reason I say I think is because I don't think that they were going for something that looked amazing. They were going for campy. So yes, exactly. they knocked it out of the park for what they were going for, but you can't say it was high quality stuff. Um, I mm, no, I disagree. I think it was pretty high quality for practical effects, but I love when a movie is so aware of what it's trying to do that it doesn't try and overshoot with amazing special effects when its entire goal is to be fun, campy horror. I, I, Tales from the Crypt nails this in every instance. Sounds like you and I are just talking about different sides of the same coin. Fair enough. Uh, Rafe rescues Catherine. They go to the church to broadcast the existence of vampires. Fine. I think that's stupid. Uh, of course, Lilith is there, and she handcuffs Rafe to a railing and attacks Catherine. I don't know why she... Oh, I guess she's just trying to keep him alive because his blood is one in a million. Mm -hmm. And Rafe uses the aforementioned laser to cut Lilith's heart into pieces because it burns the, the cross shape. But it won't kill her because the heart is still in her body. So Catherine stabs her from behind, removing the heart, and Lilith burns to death? Yep, that's what happened. How do you feel about that? No, I don't care. Yeah, for some reason, I don't either. I've been enjoying this movie the entire time until we get to this scene. And as everything happens, I'm just kind of done with it. Yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm just like, yeah, this is par for the course. Okay. You're not going to explain much of anything to me, so sure, why not? It, it, the whole movie up until this point has been a lot of fun, and this scene feels like they didn't know what to do, and they had to wrap it up. So, like, well, the, this just ties everything together. I actually, I really hate this scene. But with the help of a rabbi, they consecrate Lilith's remains. Um, the two seem to be a couple now, but as they get into the car, Catherine puts the moves on Rafe before revealing herself to be a vampire and killing the investigator. Okay. That ending felt pretty Tales from the Crypt. It really did. Um, and then we get the return to the Crypt Keeper with another few ghoulish jokes and then roll credits. Um, the ending felt really, really rushed to me. Mm, yeah, pretty The much. rest of the movie was a lot of fun, and this felt like, they didn't know where they were going, so let's just tie everything up and call it quits. They didn't have an avenue for more boobs, so they were just like, all right, just finish it. You don't need an avenue. You just put them out there. Yeah, well, you know, got to make it somewhat believable. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> hey, in the context of this movie, they only occurred in a brothel and a strip club where they would be. Very good point. Let's talk numbers. Alrighty. How much did this movie cost? Can't be that high. Um, 10 million? 2.5. No, oh, geez, I overshot it. <laughs> How much did it make? 20? Don't, oh, I was going to say, don't make the same error. 5.6. Oh, I made the exact same error. <laughs> I know, I tried to warn you. <laughs> I doubled the number that I gave. I should have just doubled the number you gave. The, uh, the IMDb uh, rating, I will tell you now, is not great, but a lot better than what we get from Rotten Tomatoes. Okay, so, uh, you say not great, I'm going to say 4.6. 5.4, close. Okay. Tomato meter? 37. 14. Oof. I am not doing well with the, the numbers today. <laughs> Audience score? 28. A lot closer, 31. Well, see, what I did that time was just double the number. <laughs> yeah, I, know. I know what you're doing. <laughs> it seemed like the safe bet. <laughs> <laughs> and you were right. You were off by like three. All right. All right. All right. Let's get into these awards. Okay. So who did you have for your least favorite character? Catherine. 
Erica what? Olaniak played the role very, very well. She was just there to serve the purpose to get Rafe to look for Caleb to unfold the rest of the plot. That's all she had to do. We didn't need any of her character development because none of it mattered. Uh, it was great to see her on screen. I think she is a very good actor. Um, but I feel like you could have anybody play that role. Like The role was just there to link pieces of the story together and not actually shine or take the forefront. Okay. You? Yeah, I went with JC. This wow. character oh, okay, stopped. Yeah. Uh, we can we can debate the performance if we want, but I don't like this character. He's way too cocky. He has no backup plan. You hate him so much that you don't even care when he kind of like sacrifices himself and is giving you the information in his dying breath. Like this guy just sucks. I get what you're saying. I do. You, you can uh, even argue that the casting was wasted by giving uh, Sarandon this role where there's really like nothing he could have done with it. And I don't think there's anything anybody could have really done with this role. Interesting. Yeah, I wonder who else could you cast that would have made the role any better? I mean, the role is really just to be hated but they don't do it well enough to give you any sympathy for the turn so i mm. don't think i don't think an actor's performance is gonna save that yeah i'd never really thought about that i i have to agree with you on that one um i just i i think i just like seeing chris sarandon on screen because he is an amazing actor and no one seems to acknowledge that yeah, and I think that's where we're going to get into the debate of character versus actor. But I'm specifying yeah. that I'm picking it because yeah. of the character. No, justified completely. I totally understand that. Uh, favorite character? <laughs> Do you need to ask? Yes. It's Rafe. His entire personality is the entire, the, the exact thing I'm going to gravitate to in a movie. Especially yeah. a movie like this where... It is pretty shallow, and there isn't a lot to grasp onto. So the personality traits of a guy who's just sarcastic, sharp tongue, very, very casual performance is absolutely fantastic to me. He is very much you. You know that, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm hesitant to admit it, but yes. It's honestly kind of why I picked this movie. Okay. Because when I watch it, I'm like, that's something Sandra would say. That's something Sandra would say. That is the take Sandra would have in the situation. <laughs> what did you have for your favorite character? Uh, Caleb. Corey yeah. Feldman gives his best performance I have ever seen in this movie. But he's barely in it. Well, then it's Rafe. Okay. <laughs> I mean, you can pick what you want. <laughs> I know, I know. I thought you would bring that up. Like, uh, You have to agree with me that Corey Feldman nailed this role. It just wasn't big enough. He's absolutely in it enough to, to say that he could be eligible for uh, the award. It's not like he's just a cameo. Yeah. But you give him this performance, he's shining above most everyone else, and then he's not in it near enough. Yeah. Not to say he's not in it, he's just not in it enough. Yeah. So I will then go with Rafe Gutman. Um, I knew you he's such me. a lovable asshole. And yeah, that is you. You yeah. are a lovable asshole. Well, you gotta, if you're going to do something, you got to be the best at it. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck. <laughs> oh, God. I forgot where we were. <laughs> well, for, for a memorable line, I had to pick one of Rafe's, of course. Okay. Um, it's when he tries to go to the brothel for the first time, and uh, uh, McCutcheon basically tells him to go grieve somewhere else. And Rafe just says, If I don't grieve right now, maybe two or three times, I'm gonna go to my mind. Yeah, <laughs> he's such an asshole in this movie. Yeah. I love it. Like, you're just you're, you're leaning forward on the edge of your seat, just waiting to see the next dick line he has to say to someone. He's so good. Yeah. You? Uh, you shouldn't be surprised by this one. Um, it's when he says, it's like I'm in a bad Tales from the Crypt episode. 
Because you know me and people saying the titles of things yes. within the things. And it's also that it came from him, too. Like, that's, that's a perfect combination. It couldn't really be anything else. Yeah. No, it, great pick. Absolutely yeah. great pick. What about your memorable scene? I gotta go with the dartboard, and it's primarily because I have no idea <laughs> why this guy would agree to do this. The whole time I'm watching it, I'm like, he's gonna hit him in the junk. He's That's your most hit him in the memorable junk. scene? It stands out! There's just so the stupid! Fuck, man? There's so much more going on here! <laughs> and by much just... more, I mean the nudity. What? <laughs> There's nudity all over the internet! Yeah, I know. But not in movies that we cover. And here, it, it doesn't serve a purpose. And that's what I, I find really interesting about it. It's just kind of like, here it is. Here it is. Here it is. <laughs> we don't really have a story. Here's nudity. Like, it... Doesn't that feel like it kind of cheapens it? Like, yes. I know that it's intentional, but you run the risk of having it come off as, well, we can't do a good scene here so we're just gonna put in the boobs where we need to save the movie exactly that's exactly my point uh, uh, that because he pins it to me i'm not no, picking that as the most memorable moment well uh, that it it's mine you're allowed um, to pick what you want yeah it's when they the open the casket and the first thing you see are tits and my thought is okay this is what we're getting from this movie um immediately you know this isn't going to be nearly as good as Demon Knight. Um, they're just kind of riding the wave of how much of a surprise success that movie was. Um, like I said before, I love how they embrace the campiness in, in Tales from the Crypt. But I feel like this was, while an enjoyable film, the downfall for the franchise. Because they, they've already gotten out of the late 80s, early 90s. And now they have nothing else to show. So they're relying on shit like dick jokes and nudity. And while it kind of works here, well, I'd say for the most part it does work, you know there's not going to be a successful third Tales from the Crypt film. So yeah, my memorable scene at 14 is this because it made me really excited to see what else we were going to get. But watching it today, it's memorable because this is all we're really going to get from this movie. Okay, then. Um, final thoughts? I, I feel like I pretty much just gave them. Um, depending you on your did, age, yeah. <laughs> it's either an amazing film or very lackluster. It's a fun entry in the Tales from the Crypt series, but far from the best. Um, if you want the epitome of what Tales from the Crypt is, watch Demon Knight or a couple of the episodes from the first three seasons of the show. Uh, this is a really fun movie. Uh, you'll never see Corey Feldman nail a role as well as he does as Caleb in this. Um, it's fun to see Dennis Miller do something that's not super fucking annoying, because he is actually a piece of shit. But, um, yeah, it, it's, it's a fun film, but you want it to be more. And there's a lot of people and scenarios in here that could have done better and have been better. And it's, it's kind of disappointing. Uh, I would recommend everyone check it out, but I know a lot of people wouldn't like it. Sandra, what's your take? So I watched this movie the first time with my buddy Ryan. Um, he was really excited when he heard that we were going to do this movie because he... Mm -hmm remembered loving it as a child. Um, shout out to Ryan, by the way. He's probably listening. I hope so. Ryan, you're amazing. By the end of the movie, we just looked at each other and we were like, what the heck was that garbage? We both hated this movie. And you, I just hate it? don't know how this came from any sort of connection to Demon Knight because that oh. movie was good. Oh. Wow. And that's maybe the biggest opposite between the two movies that makes them not the same, Tales from the Crypt, is that this one's junk. <sighs> okay. I'm sorry, that, but if you take away hurt. the gratuitous boobs, which maybe that's one of the reasons that some people who were around your age when they saw this movie for the first time carried nostalgia for it. Yeah, you're probably this, right. This is a bare-bones movie 
riddled with plot holes, <laughs> a runtime that just feels like it goes way longer than it actually is, very few redeeming characters. Like, I enjoyed Rafe, but he's a garbage character. Yeah. I did not like this movie, and I don't recommend it. If anybody is even considering it, don't, and just watch Demon Knight. I mean, yeah, I would definitely recommend Demon Knight over this, but wow, that's that was a very harsh, harsh take. I'm surprised. I thought you would have enjoyed it a little bit, but... I'm starting to think that the reason that I don't remember anything from when I watched it with you is because I tried to push it out of my memory <laughs> for being so garbage. <laughs> Fair, fair enough, man. Anyway, that's our thoughts on Bordello of Blood. If you'd like to share your thoughts, you can hit us up on social media. We are on uh, Twitter, because I'm still calling it that as long as I can. <laughs> At BS Bargain Bin, Facebook.com slash BS Bargain Bin, BS Bargain Bin dot com. And of course, YouTube.com slash At BS Bargain Bin. Ben. Yo. What are we watching next week, bud? Well, I had one picked, but then I said I would give you the choice uh, between my pick and uh, From Dust Till Dawn. Just go with your pick. Um, I think you might find this one interesting. Okie dokie. It's from the mid-2000s. Okie dokie. And it is uh, a movie that got you interested in podcasting. So. We are finally going to have a one-on-one -on -one discussion about 2007's Time Crimes. Until next time, have a good one. All the best.